It's another lovely week, and thank you for staying with KTN Farmers TV. I'm Philip Keitang, and this is This Week in Agriculture. On this week's show, I'm joined by Linda Munyao. Welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. I am an environmental scientist by training. I work in consultancy, so I'm a private consultant. I have a company that I run, but I'm also a member of Environment Institute of Kenya, actually the Vice Chair of Environment Institute of Kenya, which is a professional association for environmental practitioners. Welcome so much and thank you for agreeing to come. Asante. I'm very sure our viewers will um, learn a lot from this conversation. Thank you. But maybe before we start, we'll look uh, at one of the topics of discussions today. Um, and it's a very um, hot issue at the moment, the locust. So let's look at a story that uh, my colleagues did uh, in the course of the week. In February last year, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, issued an alert about the desert locust invasion that were first reported in Yemen. The locust then spread to, to Africa through Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea before crossing to Kenya through Mandera where they, have, they were first sighted. They have now invaded eight other counties now the government and the county government have been doing aerial spraying in affected counties. We find a calm Kachuru village as residents relieve the ordeal they had to undergo for the last two days. The village and areas surrounding it had been turned into a battlefield. Both the young and old joined hands in a bid to get rid of them. Mitungi, <laughs> As the residents fought them from the ground, Sky Team sprayed the locusts with fipronil. The area of focus was Kipsing and Kachuru bordering Isiolo County. Meru Agriculture CEC Carolyn Mutiga confirmed that the sprayed area was inspected and there was no sign of the locusts and they may have died or dispersed. Residents of Meru County will no longer have to engage in running battles with these unique strangers even as monitoring and surveillance continues. After two days or so of fighting the locusts in Meru County, they have vanished and Kachuru area is now free of these insects and residents can go back to feeding their animals even as the county government insists that they are doing surveillance 24 hours a day. Maybe Linda, um, just give us your opinion on this issue. Uh, desert locusts are, you know, something that occurs in nature and most of the time these animals are solitary. They like to just live and mind their own business in their habitat. So they're mostly found in the desert areas, as you can hear, probably started in Yemen. So that's where they live and stay. So they are coming to Kenya is actually like a spread when they no longer have sufficient food there. So they are naturally occurring. It's just that the, what is unnatural about it is the swarming or the proliferation of them, you know, to large swarms of millions of them. So that's when we start to get concerned. Yeah. So as a country, what do we need to do or what do we need to know in containing uh, the spread? The first thing that, uh, that's important to know is that uh, normally spraying should be the last intervention. That is when all else has failed. So you see, ideally when you have early warnings, they should be controlled before they become uh, you know, a flying mass. Because that's when now they become you know, terrible, it's not easy to predict where they're going except maybe when you can predict wind patterns. So the challenge would be that uh, if we had early warnings, which we did, we should have actually begun to work with our neighboring countries to combat them when they were still 
at the stage where they are, you know, moving on the ground, then you can, you know, combat them at the ground level by, you know, even actual manual spraying on the ground. But once they start to fly, that's when there's, you know, there's concern at that point. Okay. So are you saying now that they are flying, it will be a, li uh, a little bit difficult to contain them? Of course, because, you know, flying means they are moving. You can imagine uh, when they are on the ground, they don't cover as much distance as when they are flying. So we, are de we definitely need to be concerned about that. I was seeing uh, some statistics also from FAO this morning. Yes. And they were saying um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, um, one square kilometer, yes. you can find around 150 million of them. Oh, yes. What damage can they cause, especially for a country that we rely on agriculture for food production? So ideally, a mature adult flying locust will eat about its body weight of uh, vegetation. A locust is about two grams, so you can imagine uh, per day, one locust is eating two grams. So if you have 1.5 million per square meter, I mean, if you spread that to 10, 15 kilometers square, you can see the kind of damage that can be done to, uh, I mean, that's thousands of tons of green vegetation per day. So that's, it's quite a concern. Going forward, what should we expect? Unless we have them combated, we should expect that they, they will fly and they will move to you know, areas where it's green and they can settle and they can actually cause uh, devastation to the agriculture of our country. As a country, what do we need to do to, to avert um, a repetition of the same? We need to have early warning systems, which are probably already in place, but more importantly, we need to have preparations and emergency plans for when an invasion like this is going to occur. Because we need to have been prepared in advance. If the FAO issued this warning, then there should have been actions on the ground starting from the time of the warning, including, you know, prevention actions. But why now? Why now? Conditions are perfect. You see, remember I told you in the beginning that these locusts are mostly solitary to start with. They are just minding their own business. But when everything becomes perfect, you know, there has to be the right temperature, there has to be perfect moisture, there has to be good vegetation. Remember in the last few months we've had heavy rainfall and seasonal heavy rainfall, even including in areas like Somalia and, you know, in the northern parts of Africa towards Yemen. So this provided an abundance of food. So, and uh, the temperatures were right for them to hatch, and so they started to feed. And when food is in abundance, the population grows. And when the population grows, they kind of tend to outgrow the area in, in that there will not be enough food in the desert areas for them. So they need to spread out to look for food. So it's just that there was a perfect balance, the perfect mix that enabled them, you know, to proliferate, increase in population, and then they have to now fly out to look for um, food. How um, does also spring affect um, our food production in terms of uh, the quality of food that we may have at the end of the season? The challenge with spraying um, is that a lot of these sprays have a, a residual effect in the environment. Uh, many of these sprays that target locusts also have an impact on other species. So you see they're not selective. So they'll come, if you, if you spray say um, 50 square kilometers, in that 50 square kilometers, there are also beneficial insects, uh, reptiles, and other varieties of, of, of organisms that can tend to be affected. There's also the thought of, is this uh, the chemicals that we are using? Are they the type that stay in the environment longer? What impact will they have on the water sources, on, you know, on, on, on fish, if it's in an area that has uh, rivers or you know, places where we actually get food? And also what impact will they have on other crops, you know, spraying those crops, will they then be safe for us to eat? So we need to be more, um, say, conscious about uh, the, where the sprays will be conducted. And also, you know, the government needs to join together with the authorities that deal with uh, pesticides and just inform the general public that if this area has been sprayed, what then do you need to do? What do you need to know? How can I be safe? How can I make sure that the food that I'm going to eat after this is safe. And of course, to protect our colony of bees, you know, because they do the pollination. They are the ones that help us to make sure that we actually have food for tomorrow. So there need to be interventions to make sure that these things are done correctly. And also spraying time has to be put into consideration that we're actually spraying when they are here, because you can spray and then the guys have moved on. So it will have been a waste of the chemical and also a lost opportunity to target the, the locusts.
Thank you very much, Linda. I know this, um, we'll still follow up on this conversation. Yeah. Uh, it's still a developing issue. Uh, we're hoping the government is doing enough and they'll be able to contain it. But for now, let's leave it there. We'll uh, follow it next time. But now let's look at another related issue of, of, of a similar incident that happened some time back. The fall armyworm was first reported in Western Kenya by farmers in March of 2017 and immediately confirmed by the Kenya Plant and Health Inspectorate Services and the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Organization, CALRO, as of the 23rd May of 2017. The fall armyworm had affected more than 143,000 acres of land in major maize and wheat growing counties. Now authorities in Malawi are saying the invasion by the fall armyworm is threatening to create a food shortage in the South African country. Since the rain started in, in November, the worms have destroyed crops for a quarter million farm, farmers and families. 26-year-old Malawian farmer Teresa Manuel is among farmers West affected by an invasion of four army worms. The mother of three normally harvests over 40 bags of maize from her two acre garden, but this season she is expecting almost nothing. My entire maize field has been attacked by the army worms, and I have nothing now. Army worms are an invasive pest from the Americas that has devastated crops in Africa since 2016. They feed on cereal crops like maize, a staple food in Malawi. Malawi authorities estimate that since November, the worms have destroyed crops for over a quarter million farming families. That means another hunger now. We are going to face hunger in this area. There are a lot of villages which have been affected, as I have said, and it means hunger now. So we need government's, government's intervention. Malawi's Minister of Agriculture blames weather patterns for the army worm invasion. The ministry is distributing free pesticides to affected farmers, but they are getting complaints that they are useless. The problem is that most farmers apply the pesticides when the worms are already grown. As a result, the worms don't die because they're old enough to resist the pesticides. Farmers like Manuel are resorting to homemade remedies to ward off the pests. As farmers, we're using our own traditional methods, like applying soil, soup from small fish, leaves from the neem tree, and powdered soap. But Malawian farmers say they need more help to recover from the pests' damage. Since government appreciates that the invasion is huge, what we want is that it would consider providing us with seeds, or they should give us food that will take us to the next growing season. Malawi authorities say they will soon distribute seeds to affected farmers. An army worm invasion in 2017 forced Malawi to declare 20 of the country's 28 districts as disaster areas. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Mulanje, Malawi. Linda, this is a similar incident. This one came earlier. Um, what are, are there any similarities or are there any um, points maybe we missed when the fall army worm came, first came? I think uh, first uh, the key difference between the fall army worm and say the locusts is that these are the, the, the locusts are, you know, native to Africa, but the fall armyworm came from somewhere else. So you see the difference is that the, the fall armyworm probably does not have a natural um, enemies that can help to control it. So um, that's, you know, just, that's just one key difference. But the mode of destruction, the attacks on, 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 on crops and vegetation, is definitely, you know, you could say are, are similar between the two. So what did we miss? I think initially the, I don't know, I'm not sure if we had prior, you know, advance warning about the fall army worm and how serious it was going to be compared to, for example, the, the locusts. But I remember at that time, you know, sometime last year, it, it actually became a concern in the previous two years for farmers. So it's more or less the same thing with just a few differences that 
Notification is critical. Information for identification also is very critical. So this, this is very helpful to especially farmers and people on the ground to be able to know information in advance that this particular um, incident is on the way and this is what I need to know in, able to, in, in order to be able to manage the situation on the ground. Okay. The fall of as, as we've had uh, was first sighted in 2017. Yes. Uh, it's three years now down the line and we've not been able to contain it. And the spread of the worm, we know that um, it has been moving also very fast. Yes. And it's like we've not been able to contain it. What could be some of the reasons why we, the governments, especially in Africa, uh, East and Central Africa, have not been able to contain the fall of worm? I think uh, there's lots of reasons why it's difficult to manage such invasions. The biggest one I could say is uh, resources. Sometimes uh, you find that tackling uh, the, the fall armyworm is a very expensive exercise. Remember, this, this has been a problem in uh, South American countries before, and as a result of it being heavily sprayed in those countries, they developed the, this particular uh, organism developed a, a, a resistant, <coughs> excuse me, a resistant strain. So you find that even the applications of uh, pesticides that were being done at that time were not working. Why? Because this thing has already developed resistance because it's been around for so long in South America and they've dealt with it chemically. So first, uh, resistance is a problem. And so it becomes hard when you're trying to kill something and it's just, I'm not dying, I'm not dying. So that becomes a problem. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll also keep following the same. Um, hoping uh, Africa will be able to contain the fall amyom as well. Um, let's also look at a, a third a topic that we had for today. The thought of rising sea level and more intensive heat waves are enough to keep you up at night. But while we all know the situation is getting more serious, most of us are preoccupied with work, paying bills, doctor's appointment, and these immediate visceral worries win every time. There is not much time left to figure out how to bring global warming closer to the forefront of people's minds to reduce the carbon fo footprint. Our reporter Esther Gishuki explores the adjustment you can make in your life to reduce your, foot your carbon footprint. Since December 2015, when 195 countries signed the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, Several countries in Africa have begun implementing climate resilience activities that will allow them to better absorb and adapt to harsh climate changes, Kenya being one of them. The Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries has developed various initiatives on climate change adaptation and mitigation. And this is the Kenya Agricultural Insurance Program as an example which is 50% subsidized by the government of Kenya and is a comprehensive crop insurance scheme to manage a range of climate-related risks. While Kenya has made major strides since then, there is still more to be done both at an individual level and national level. At an individual level, changes in the way you live your life, both big and small, can help reduce your own personal carbon footprint and also encourage policy markets to act for the good of the planet, such as the case of Samuel Drigo. The challenges of the farmers, knowing very well that the yields were declining year after year, and I was determined, including during my school days, to bring a change to this. Because I know millions of children rely on agriculture, and the common story of go to school, work hard, and don't come back to the farm. And yet we are relying on food we have to eat. So how comes if we all left the farm, what is left of us? John Thiongo based in Shubiri, Mwea County, is one of the beneficiaries who has seen tremendous benefit from using the fertilizer. Nilianza kutumia organic, bio organic manure. Sasa niko nimeitumia kwa miaka Exploring 
in Nairobi County, Teddy Kenyanjui of Cookswell, Kenya, is also pioneering climate smart techniques. Being able to take a branch from my backyard, make it into charcoal and then cook my dinner, that's completely off grid and it's a very, very sustainable, cheap way of you know, using your energy. Not only can you use all the small branches and the small twigs, you can also use maize cobs, you can also use coconut husks, you can use waste from the rose farms, uh, waste from the timber yards, the furniture makers. So any type of hard woody biomass, you can carbonize with one of our kilns and make charcoal that you don't have to briquette, it's ready to use when it comes out of the kiln. If creating a business is not your thing, don't fret. Here are four simple ways you can help in the fight against climate change. Start your fight against climate change today. Reporting for KTN Farmers TV, I am Esther Gishuki. Linda, you are a scientist yes. and an environmentalist. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what we need to know about global warming and climate change and what we need to do to reduce our carbon footprint. I think uh, right now is the best time for us to talk about it because climate change, we have seen changes in the last few months, in the last few years. But you know, it's now becoming more and more visible. Like now we're having unseasonal rainfall. I mean, it's January, it's supposed to be hot and dry and you can see it's all lush and green. Um, you've heard about, you know, flooding in many parts of, of, of the country last year, in many parts of the world. So definitely uh, climate change is something that has finally come to our doorstep. And unfortunately, uh, science has predicted but uh, places like Africa are the ones that will be hardest hit, despite the fact that uh, we have been the least contributors to acceleration of climate change. Okay. So now that we've been warned that we'll be uh, the hardest hit, yes. um, as a country, yes. that we really rely on uh, small-scale agriculture to feed our people. Yes. We, uh, what do we need to tell our farmers or wha how do we need to educate our farmers on uh, new ways of farming that might not be affected by global warming and climate change? I think uh, we will all be affected. We just need to start to change the way we think about certain things and the way we do certain things. For example, in the last few months it's rained heavily. How much of that water did we store? How much of that water did we keep for an unseasonal drought that we are probably facing in the near future. Talking about education, yes. do you think the government and maybe um, scientists like you um, are doing enough to educate, uh, especially farmers back in the village, of what they need to do? We could definitely do more. Um, I think the, the challenge with our country is that we, we have focused so much on, on other things rather than the things that are affecting us. For example, you know, we should expect more, and I think this show is very important because we have now a, a voice to be able to speak to farmers directly, which is very important. We also need to get, you know, authorities on board. They probably may not have an opportunity because things have changed. You know, previously we had agricultural extension officers who could probably work with, you know, environmental practitioners right now to be able to educate farmers and educate the common man on the street on what kind of things need to be done in order to be able to climate proof your agriculture. So it's very important. We need to do more. There's been this conversation by um, leaders from the developed world, yes. especially one Donald Trump, yes. that global warming and climate change is a hoax. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for, for Africa and other countries that have been trying to um, uh, find ways of containing uh, global warming? You know, science and facts speak for themselves. They say facts are very stubborn. They are stubborn, they just stay there. It's like the truth, it just stays there. Even if you don't want it there, it's still there. And we can already see some of these things. So it doesn't really matter um, 
what he says, but the problem is um, he's a leader of a very powerful country. And when they start to renege on some of the treaties that they have signed, global treaties like uh, agreeing to reduce their contribution of carbon, em uh, carbon dioxide emission into the atmosphere, then that becomes our problem as well. Because we are going to receive the, you know, the most impacts, we and other uh, mostly tropical countries. So it's, it's, it's critical that we need to get with the program, whether or not that leader says that uh, there's no climate change we need to start climate proofing ourselves. We need to start climate proofing our, our, our farmers. We need to start undertaking these interventions because we know that these things are starting to happen. Maybe with that, maybe we, uh, we should take a short commercial break, but we'll be back shortly.